If you are watching and not just listening to this today, you may notice that my face is in remarkably sharp focus. That's because my friend Tim Williams was out this last week. We are, by the way, working on a series I'm very excited about where we will walk through each of the central practices or disciplines for the spiritual life. Dallas writes about 13 of them in his book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. And um, we'll walk through every one. What's the definition? What is it? Why should you do it? What's the purpose of it? How can it uh, help your life, help your growth, help you to connect with God? And then a few tips on how to actually carry it out in just a very doable, accessible way on that particular day. So that's coming up. Anyway, Tim was out and we were looking at the camera and he said, do you know a way that you can help it be focused really, really well every time you use it? I said, no. And he said, all you have to do is touch your face. And so initially I said, you mean I just have to do this? And then he explained, uh, no, you have to reach over to the screen right there and just touch your face. And the, the camera itself has this facial recognition capacity where when you touch it, I can move backwards now and I can move forward and it knows where to focus. It knows my face. It recognizes my face. Facial recognition is a remarkable capacity. And it made me think of uh, a statement in the Psalms where the psalmist says, this is Psalm 27 verse 8, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, God, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. What does it mean? Where do we find the face of God? Well, this quest is ultimately expressed in uh, the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. That's the deepest part of our lives, to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus. Now, what does he mean by the face of Jesus? Because obviously you and I have not seen the face of Jesus. One of the ironies of Jesus is that he is the most recognizable figure in the world, and yet there is not a single extent drawing or painting or obviously photo of his. So what does Paul mean when he says now we have the light of the knowledge of God's glory, of all that is best about God in the face of Jesus? So I'm going to think a little bit about Dallas Willard's theology of the face. And this is actually taken from um, uh, Michael Stewart Robb's book, the kingdom among us, where he writes about Dallas. The face is a very important part of the human person. It is how we recognize what is going on inside of us. The, the New Testament word, the Greek word for face is prosopon. And uh, you might have heard of uh, prosopognosia, which is the inability to recognize or remember faces. And that afflicts folks. I have a good friend that struggles with that. And there's a way in which kind of spiritually we have that condition. And we're not able to see the face of God. Now, what does a face refer to? Your face, from a biblical perspective, is not just that physical skin-covered part of the front of your head. It's not just your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your chin. It is those two. But it's also the place where your inner being, your inner self, your deepest character, your heart, finds outward expression. Your face is not just a physical reality. It is the outer expression of the deepest, truest part of you. And we all have a sense for this. There's a saying that gets attributed to Abraham Lincoln sometimes. After the age of 40, everybody has the face they deserve. Um, I don't think Lincoln actually said that. He did have another famous face statement that he did make. He talked one time about being accused of being a two-faced politician. He was quite famous for being homely, and his response was, really, if I had two faces, you think I'd be wearing this one? Um, but there is this reality that we all know that somehow our face reveals who it is that we are. Humans can and do use their bodies to hide their souls. By contrast, 
young children and the very old are cherished because they cannot hide or have given up hiding their souls. Likewise, our thoughts, as children soon learn, are basically hidden. Feelings, though, are much harder to hide, are masked with great ability by actors in many in professional roles, such as doctors and clinical psychologists, and I hate to say it, pastors, people in different professions. Paul Ekman is an expert in uh, emotions, and he has discovered and written about, I think it's like 42 different kind of smiles. Very famously, one of them will sometimes be called the Pan Am smile from that old airline, or the Botex, Botox smiles. Some people have to manufacture a smile, but it's interesting, when we do that, we're able to voluntarily move, I think it's the zygomotic muscle that controls the mouth. However, there is another smile called the Duchesne smile, after the guy who discovered it over 100 years ago, that is the smile of pure joy. It turns out that there are certain muscles around your eyes that you cannot control voluntarily. And they simply move when you genuinely experience joy and delight. And that's the difference between what we will sometimes talk about as a fake smile or a manufactured smile. Our attempt to manage our faces, to get people to think that we're feeling or experiencing something other than what we are. But our inner life, Dallas says, is not hidden and perhaps cannot be hidden. This is why one's inner life is connected with being the light of the world and a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Similarly, Michael goes on, this is why we will recognize one another in the post-resurrection afterlife, even though we will not have bodies. Our faces, the outer expression of our inner beings, our faces will tell those who have known us on earth who we are. He says, this is why, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration, if you know that story, um, Moses and Elijah, whose fleshly faces had long been forgotten, did not be, need to be introduced by Jesus to Peter, John, and James. Peter, John, and James recognized them by uh, their existential personas, by that expression of their deepest selves. Now, what was Jesus' face like? See you later, car going by. Um, Jesus' face was loving, joyful, and peaceful. How do we know that? Well, we know that because the Bible is quite clear that the fruit, the expression of the Spirit, or of the Spirit's presence in somebody's life, begins with love, joy, peace. And Jesus was above all, preeminently, supremely, ultimately, the man of the Spirit. So to know his face was to know a face that was characterized by being loving and joyful and peaceful. In Jesus, Dallas would sometimes say, God was putting a face to the kingdom and a kingdom to the face. In other words, it turns out that the face of Jesus is the face of God. And the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Jesus. So, um, to those who, like Paul, were not able to access Jesus' loving, peaceful, joyful face in private on earth. This is what he's writing about in 2 Corinthians 4 when he says, we've been given the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus. When we were not able to see the physical fleshly face, his life, his interactions with people, his words, his teachings, his generosity, his love and joy and peace, and then his death uh, uh, sacrificially, and then his resurrection, proclaim his face. We know the face of Jesus. We cannot hide our faces. I was thinking about a movie you may have seen. It was called The Sixth Sense. And there is this young boy, Cole, who is given visions that horrify him, and he's afraid of being thought a freak and rejected as a loser. And so he doesn't want to reveal himself fully to his mom. He doesn't want to show his face. And you might remember his mom says to him at several points in the movie, Cole, look at my face. Now what is she saying there? She's not just saying, notice the skin on the front of my head. She is saying, I love you from the core of my being, and I cannot hide that. And when you look at my face, you will know that you are loved. 
Michael says about Dallas's thought here, the psychology of the face is vital to understanding the incarnation's unique role in redemption. Simply put, Jesus manifested the triune God's face to people simply by being present with them in human form while he was on earth. Humanity suffered from wretched theology. Who is God? I'm afraid of him. I don't trust him. In Jesus, God is saying to you right now, look at my face. So, today, be a student of the face of God. Look at the faces of people in your life because they have been made in God's image and Jesus is somehow present in what we think of as the least of them. Notice faces. Where are people worn or tired or beaten down or joyful? And how can you be with them? And how can you help them? Notice the face of God in his creation. I'm standing here because I don't know if you'll be able to see it or not, but there's a little burst of yellow right up there in that field. And this is now connected to what we talked about a week or so ago, uh, the relationship between spirit and matter. That part of why your face is the expression of your inner person is it is the place where your spirit shines through electrons and protons. And for God, that happens throughout all of his creations. The, hell, the heavens declare the glory of God and the face of God we see all around us. And he is literally manifesting his heart for us in the beauty of creation. And then, tell your face, you are loved by God. Just take a look at your face every once in a while today and see what message is in it. And remember that you too may be given the gift of a loving, joyful, peaceful face. And it's a strange thing, but when you just take a deep breath, have that thought and smile, not the Botox smile, uh, some of God's presence seeps into your heart as well. Today, think about Jesus, because Jesus is the face of God. Second thoughts about faces. Hi, I'm Tim. Thanks for joining us here at Become New. We hope that these videos help you to grow spiritually one day at a time. If you'd like to find more resources, you can go to our website, becomenew.com. There you can sign up for the daily emails that go along with each video. You can access our full library of videos there. And you can let us know if you're interested in some of the upcoming leadership resources that we're working on right now. If you've got a prayer request, we would love to pray for you. You can text us that request at 855-888-0444. Our team meets daily Monday through Friday to pray for those requests. And so thanks for letting us come alongside you in your spiritual growth journey. We'll see you next time.